room and board. No, I'm going to let that bait him. But he would go ahead and begin to make tents again and sell them for his livelihood. This was God's love. This was God's love when they would laugh at him because there was something about him that they did not understand, something they did not like. He would go beyond all of this and he would continue because he was going to birth them in Christ. And he had the faith to believe that these immature young Corinthians could be changed by the power of God until their thoughts could be deep, until they wouldn't be just talking about miracles, but they would be looking for the greatest miracle among the other miracles, and that miracle of a changed heart and life complete until people could look at them and see the love of Jesus in their lives. He wouldn't stop. <laughs> The Apostle Paul, he looked and he saw that it was a losing battle in many degrees. He saw the more that he loved, they loved less. But he continued because he knew that if he loved enough, sooner or later the devil would have nothing to hide this love with. Sooner or later the truth was going to manifest itself. It might happen a six months down the road or a year. But those people who said that Paul is only here for his own reasons, that Paul isn't very smart, that Paul doesn't have much scriptural sense, that this was going to turn around. He believed in the power of truth, and he believed in the power of love. And if he had to bankrupt heaven, he was going to pour enough of God's love down into Corinth until Corinth would be changed by the power of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what you have to do when you come into a place where you find that you're rejected, where you find that you're looked at as though contempt is a part of your life. You've got to let God's word and God's spirit and God's truth flow through you until other people have to acknowledge, I am wrong. I need God to change me. The other person hasn't been a fool. The other person has been an instrument of God's grace and glory. And my God, it's me. I stand in the need of prayer. I need to be changed. I need to be transformed by your spirit, God. I need that touch. The Apostle Paul continued to pour out love until the contempt that he felt couldn't last any longer. The Apostle Paul continued to pour out love until the distortions that demon spirits had brought into the minds of others could not continue. He continued to pour out love until those who were deceived by the power of the enemy began to sense Here's a man who's bigger than all of us put together. And we've been making fools of him when it's us who needs to be free from foolishness. He ministered and ministered and ministered until truth began to reveal itself. And the Spirit of God is here tonight. And he declares, I don't know what your situation is, but I will tell you this. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. You can take Paul and you can beat him and you can stone him. You can laugh and you can jeer, but he's going to show up again. You can take Paul and you can laugh and ridicule and misunderstand him, but he's going to show up again. You can take Paul and you can leave him and go away and never come back again for a year. But he's going to still be around. And sooner or later, you're going to understand that Paul wears you out because Paul has the spirit of Jesus and he doesn't get tired. He doesn't give up. He doesn't change. The unchanging power of Jesus is in his life. And sooner or later, you're going to be down somewhere and looking up and saying, Paul, I need you to help me. I've seen God work in your life. Because love does not win every week. Because love does not win every Friday. Because God's ways do not pay off every time. Many people get discouraged and they quit. But I tell you, Christian, number one, make sure that you and Paul have something in common. 
that you know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings of Jesus, that you're able to say, I know this Christ. I have a relationship with him and the devil can't make a fool out of me because I put myself in complete obedience unto Jesus and the life that I live is the life of the Son of God and stay steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the faith and there will come a day when even even your enemies will be at peace with you because they will have to acknowledge that God is working in your life. Hallelujah. The way to handle honest misunderstandings and all of Corinth was honestly in their spirit, proud and arrogant, foolish as foolish can be, but they honestly felt they had it together. And they looked at the apostle Paul and said, he's not together yet. And he was worth more than every one of them in his attitude and spirit and life. The way to handle it is to be true to God without wavering. The apostle Paul knew that time was in his favor. People who lie are going to lose out in the end. People who are failing are going to manifest their failure. But if you're on a foundation sooner or later, even your enemies are going to have to recognize that of a truth God is in your life. Be steadfast, be steadfast, be steadfast. You'll win if you're not weary. In well-doing, in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. The Apostle Paul didn't always look exciting. Some ministries came along that seemed to be able to stir the people. And there were those who knew how to get response from men. And they used it far more than Paul. But Paul came not with the excellency of speech. It was not with enticing words of men's wisdom. But he came with the purity of the gospel. He came with a word that would wear well. It was a word that came from heaven. And people said it doesn't sound too exciting. But they began to see that this man had something that God had given him. And it worked every day of the week. It was that which was consistent. It brought forth all that God had promised. The apostle Paul stayed true. And as he stayed true and continued to minister, people began to grow. Corinth, the church there began to grow. And the more it began to grow, the more it understood that this man, Paul, knew him and the power of Christ living and resurrection authority in his life. He was able to see this church turn around. Why? Because he was rooted and grounded in the truth. He was rooted and grounded in the things of God. He was able to know what the problem was in the moment. These were children who hadn't grown up yet. But praise God, children can grow up. If you're a father in the spirit tonight, rejoice because the people that need to grow are going to grow. If you're a child in this service tonight, rejoice because children will grow. You will come into maturity. You will come into wisdom. You will come into understanding of God's ways and purposes. Be not weary. God shall bring it to pass. You can rejoice. You're going to come forward in victory. And though it seemed like you wait for it so long, rejoice because God is true to his word. And and he shall bring you forth into victory. Begin to rejoice and thank God even in this moment in the middle of the storm. The Apostle Paul looked at these people and he said, The more I love you, the less you love me. And the Apostle Paul understood and didn't see it as some terrible thing, but he saw that it was childishness. Perhaps one of the biggest problems we have in the church is just old-fashioned childishness. Sometimes I'd like to take a hold of some of you that I know a bit, grab you and shake you good, and say, come on, grow. Come on, let's get on to the place where it's fun. Let's get on to the place where it's victory. You are not called to be a child all your life. You've been called to be brought to the place where you have abilities, ability to make decisions and hang in there. 
ability to make choices and remain in that choice, uh, ability to turn to God and say, God, I commit myself to you and be true to your commitment. You're not without power. Whatever decision that God has ordained, you have the power to make that decision and come forth in victory. One of the problems, though, that children have is that often they, in their childishness, smart from their immaturity, and they want to grow up, and so they begin to challenge the parents because they're in that in-between place where that they're not mature enough to be an adult, and they aren't able to stay as a child because there's signs of stirrings inside that said, you two are meant to come to victory. And so they begin to challenge the parents, their authority. They begin to challenge the parents' wisdom. Don't you challenge God's authority and wisdom, but begin in this moment to say, I know what's stirring inside of me. God is calling me to maturity. And instead of copping out by blaming other people or blaming leadership, I'm going to seek the face of God. I'm going to begin to pray. I'm going to get into God's word. I'm going to rejoice. And I'm going to exercise hope that is mine, that God has said it. It's my joy this moment to believe that God calls all of of his children to maturity that not one person is meant to remain a child not one the only thing that makes us stay a child is pride the pride in our rebellion the pride in our mocking other people the pride that we have in having disgust for others these things will leave us in the bondage of childishness. It'll leave us in immaturity and sin. But the moment we begin to sense how wonderful God is, and everything that I have is merely from God a gift, and that I don't have to build myself up, neither do I have to knock others down, but I can share with people, I too see the stirrings of God in my life. And what I find within, it's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous. And because I see it in my life, and I don't need to have it all by myself, I can look and see God doing something in your life. And what God is doing in your life, I rejoice with too. I rejoice in that. Stand with me in the service. Let's cover a few points before we bring the service to a close. Number one. Whatever you've gotten from God has not been because you have been clever or dedicated or anything else. It's merely that God is good. And as a father, he would let us know the goodness of his love. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. Not one of us are blessed because of our own merit. By grace are we saved. Through faith, it's God's grace poured out upon men. And next to that, we can thank God that he participates in all of humanity with stirrings to bring us to maturity. And as long as we're willing to be humble before him, we'll see God changing us, rearranging us and transforming us into his likeness, his love. I encourage every one of you today to Take the things of God with gratitude. To thank God for his mercy. To praise God for his kindness. Don't take it for granted. Don't sneer at God, but thank him for his goodness. I encourage you to do that. To let God move in your life. I encourage you today to understand that the love of God is to pour out upon you every good gift. Not to absorb you, but to equip you. For God's will is not to take what's yours, but he wants you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. That's his will. Dear Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus today. I'm asking, dear God, that you'd be with all of us here today. And that you cause us, dear God, to rejoice in your love and your mercy. That we begin to sense, dear God, that you're working in hidden ways. And obvious as well that you're moving dear God behind us and before us that you're showing yourself dear God as a God of mercy and kindness 
And I pray to God that we would make room for that mercy and kindness.